Hornet Pharmaceutical, Chapter 1, November 17, 2006. It's the 10th anniversary of the disappearance of the town B. Cavern. The case was closed on May 5th, 2001, but one man named Evan Riley was interested in the case due to no one having a clue as to why B. Cavern vanished. But there was also another element of the case that interested him, and that element was a mysterious pharmaceutical company called Hornet Pharmaceutical and how said pharmaceutical was brought up multiple times. Huh. This Hornet Pharmaceutical seems to be brought up in this case a lot, Evan thought to himself. Maybe I should ask a buddy about this. Maybe they might know, Evan says as he packs up the documents into a briefcase and leaves for the police station, being seen by one of his buddies, Mike Azazel. Oh, hey Evan, what brings you here? Mike asks Evan. Well, I have been looking into the disappeared to be cavern and the pharmaceutical that is constantly brought up in the case, Evan advice. Funny you mention that because recently some VHS tapes were found that are part of the case, Mike replies. Oh, sweet. You think I, that I could borrow them? Evan asks. I don't know. I don't think Jack's site will let. Before Mike could finish what he was saying, another one of Evan's police buddies, Lucas Jones, comes over with the box of tapes and hands it to him. Yes, you can have them. In fact, keep them. Lucas exclaims. Oh, thanks, Lucas. Evan smiles as a little, little as he takes the box. Uh, Lucas, you remember what Jack said? Lucas interrupts Mike once again with him holding up his hand at Mike's face. Listen, his words don't matter. I want nothing to do with this case. And every time I lay my eyes on these tapes, I just want to be nowhere near them. Lucas exclaims as Evan was quiet. I'm just gonna leave. Evan says as Mike and Lucas begin arguing, not noticing that someone was watching him. Evan makes his way back to his place, going into his office that used to be his bedroom before he converted it into his office for more space to look into the B. Cavern case. His desk was covered in news clippings that were previously used in the case investigating the disappearance of B. Cavern. There were also a few miscellaneous things like a tie-dye comic, a drawing of himself made by his five-year-old nephew, and some old-looking wallets Evan found due to him having an interest in collecting wallets that have been left behind. Evan opens up his closet and pulls out his favorite CRT TV and places it on his desk. Before he starts his first tape, he leaves his office and then comes back with a bowl of Lucky Charms as he prepares himself for what he is going to witness. Although Evan was interested in the case, he was slightly scared of what he would find due to how mysterious this case was. So he grabs a nearby stress ball and squeezes it lightly as he breathes in and then out and then put the tape in the CRT TV, then realizing that he forgot to plug it in. Okay, Evan, need to stop stalling. Evan thinks to himself as he gets up and plugs in the CRT TV and then sits back down, taking another moment to breathe in, then out as the CRT TV turns on and starts the tape. The tape starts with a logo of the Ted's Country Police Department, followed by another logo of the B. Cavern Police Department, followed by another logo of Hornet Pharmaceutical. How many logos does this tape have? Evan sighs in some sort of commercial place. Are you feeling down? Are you scared that life just isn't enough? And that you are a failure to everyone you meet? The commercial shows stock footage of people who are either very depressed or crying, followed by a man walking on screen. The man looked like Adam Sandler's but in his mid-70s and in, in some professional-looking suit. Hi, I'm Sejur D. Case, and I'm here to tell you that there is a solution in the form of Joy Talk X. The man says as everyone was taking notes. Joy Talk X is a pill that contains good toxins and substances that can help one's mood improve. The man exclaims. Good toxins and substances? Yeah, that's not suspicious. Evan says as he writes this down. So contact Hornet, Hornet Pharmaceutical today to get prescribed a Joy Talk X so you can fight back against depression. The man says as the commercial ends, and Evan goes back to writing notes, not noticing the fact that Cesar D. Case was still on screen, looking, direct, looking directly at Evan. As Evan looked up, he sees Cesar for a second, and then he disappears. What the hell? Evan mutters as the tape goes on to give a report that this was one of the first commercials of Hornet Pharmaceutical and how Joy Talk X has been described as a Trojan horse medicine, medicine that's disguised as one medicine only to be something dangerous instead. 
The tape then shows that the medicine has made people sick, but not sick enough to cause panic. There were even some cases of people going missing, the seeming odd to happen. Tape ends as Evan looks at his notes and begins theorizing what the first tape was about. But then Evan hears the, his doorbell ring and he heads downstairs to see who it was. He looks through his peephole and jumps. Who he saw was a 19 year old who had the scar formation of a smile on his mouth and cheeks. But what caught him off guard was the fact that he had a police badge. What? That doesn't make sense. Evan saw it as the 19 year old rings the doorbell again. Hello? Mr. Riley? Are you there? The 19 year old said as Evan reluctantly opened the door. Yes. Who are you? Evan asks. I'm Officer Ryfield. Jeffrey Ryfield. My Azazel convinced me to come meet you and try and help with the, your investigation, Jeffrey says. Oh. Well, come in, Evan says as he lets Jeffrey in. Just don't kill me. Evan replied, knowing about Jeffrey's past. Hornet Pharmaceutical, Chapter 2. So, you live here now? Jeffrey asks. Yeah, obviously this place has changed a lot since you were, um, moved out, Evan says, says carefully choosing his words. And honestly, it's not this place was destroyed after my incident, Jeffrey says as Evan gulps slightly. So, where do you keep everything? Jeffrey asks as he and Evan go up to his office. Huh, nice setup, Jeffrey comments as Evan sits down. Yeah, it's not a lot, but it works. Evan says as Jeffrey notices the tie-dye comic on Evan's desk. Wait, you read tie-dye too? Jeffrey exclaims as Evan looks at the comic. Oh yeah, it's a nice comic series and I read it in my breaks. I heard rumors that a movie is going to be coming out somewhere in 2007. Evan replies as he restarts the tape for the two to watch. As they watch, Evan goes over his notes when the tape starts to glitch. Dang it, I hate when this happens. Evan says as he gets up and bangs on the CRT TV, only for it to scream, LEAVE IT ALONE, causing Evan and Jeffrey to jump as Cesar's face appears on screen, glitching and twitching. Leave it alone, he is coming, he is still alive, Cesar screeches as he then vanishes, tape continuing as normal. What just happened? Jeffrey asks. I... I don't know, but I feel like we should take a break. Evan says, So you're not going to take the spooky face's advice? Jeffrey asks, No, but I am worried, Evan comments. The two go over notes and the two share series about what the first tape is about and also the Ghost of Cesar D case and what he was talking about. It's like there is some sort of entity behind all this, like some sort of operator, Jeffrey says as Evan listens and nods, writing this theory down. Meanwhile, Jack Side was at the police station with Mike and Lucas. Lucas, you know well that you had no right to give Evan tapes, Jack said in an annoyed tone. Again, I didn't want to be near them. Chris replied with his arms crossed, his brow in a grumpy position as Jack came closer to him. Kid, you need to get over the damn tapes, Jack said. It's not just the tapes, it's the whole investigation. I want nothing to do with this shit. Lucas yells as Jack breathes in, then out, then proceeds to backhand slap Lucas. Mike was taken aback as Jeffrey's therapist, Toby, was in the background watching everything unfold. Now, I gotta go back home. Make sure to get the tapes back by tomorrow, Jack says as he turns around and leaves as Lucas rubs his cheek. Yeah, still not doing that. He groans as Mike sighs. Jack arrives at his house, a one-story mini-mansion that was under construction due to a hurricane that passed by a few months ago. That damn kid. Giving away evidence to some failure of a detective. Jack grumbled as he hung his coat up, not noticing that someone was watching him. Jack, Jack looks around, slowly getting the feeling that he was being watched. Shit. Really need to call that construction company tomorrow. Jack sighs, not realizing he wouldn't have the chance to as a tall and slim and Delia walks in through one of the makeshift windows. Hello? Who's there? Jack exclaims as he could barely see what was happening standing in front of him. The entity standing in front of him was 15 feet tall, had pale orange skin, was in some pharmacist outfit, and the most distinctive feature of all, he had some sort of fleshy crater on the area where his face should be. Jack pulls out a gun and aims it at the entity as the entity tilts his head. Suddenly, the entity grabs Jack and holds him up by the neck. Jack chokes and squirms as suddenly, bubbling begins to form in the fleshy crater of the entity's face. The skin in the cra crater's 
beginning to melt away, revealing the face that was constantly changing to many different faces, all while the changing faces of the entity twitched and screamed. These were his victims, and Jack was its newest member. It was the next day. Evan introduced Jeffrey. Evan was introduced to Jeffrey's therapist, Toby, as Jeffrey and Lucas were looking over some other case files. Then Mike rushes in, breathing heavily. Oh, hey Mike, you okay? Jeffrey asks. No. Me and a few cops went to go check up on Jack's site when he didn't show up earlier this morning, and we found him in his house, dead. Mike exclaims as the room goes silent and everyone looks at him. What? Asks. At, the At the house, police were everywhere as Mike, Mike, Evan, Mike, Mike, and Jeffrey, and, and Lucas were looking at the body, the remains of Jack's site. His limbs were twisted, bone fragments sticking out all over his body. His torso was sliced open in his face. Oh dear god, his face was violently removed. Any of the meat that was under the removed flesh of the face was also gone. An eye hanging out of the left eye socket and the bottom jaw being missing. Here. God. Like mutters as Jeffrey looks away. Feeling like he was about to throw up. Damn. I didn't think Leatherface gave Jack a visit. Evan mutters as Lucas was quiet. Nah, this is more of a Baraka thing than a Leatherface thing. Mike comments as Evan seems to agree with Mike. I. Just mutters. I know I wasn't a big fan of Jack, especially since what happened when you and I last saw him, but I never wanted to see him end up like this. Lucas says as Mike puts his hand on his shoulder. He was harsh, but in the end, he was a good man. Mike says as he wipes away some of his tears. A little later, Evan and Jeffrey were back at Evan's house. Evan started to contemplate on continuing on with the investigation. Evan, what's wrong? Jeffrey asks. I, I'm just still shaken up by, by what happened to Jack, Evan replies. Especially since his house was a couple of blocks down from mine, and considering this place doesn't have a lot of lights, what if we're next? Evan follows up as Jeffrey sinks. Well, maybe we should move this operation to the police station, Jeffrey suggests. I mean, I don't think they'll let me, but it's worth a shot. But it won't be easy, Evan replies. But five minutes later, after a phone call between Evan and Mike, Evan had all of his things for the investigation moved into a room in the police station. Hornet Pharmaceutical, Chapter 3. The tape starts with the usual three logos, then it's followed up with an audio log from one of the pharmacists of Hornet Pharmaceutical. This man being Mike Sterlock, one of the couple survivors of the disappearance of B. Kaffer. Entry log number 5. This is Mike Sterlock. Dr. Sterlock says, I'm here to report that our tests are on our next product, Exosleep, have gone well. Although I do find it a bit odd that one of the list ingredients are insects, Dr. Sherlock says. Although I myself like bugs, hell, I like to make and collect taxidermy bugs. I still find it odd that bugs are being used for medicine, Dr. Sherlock said, comments. But hey, if the bastard Frenchies can cook up snails, then I guess us Americans can use bugs as ingredients for our medicine. Dr. Sherlock says as his audio recording ends and another one begins, the voice being familiar to Evan as he pauses the tape. Harley? Evan said. Harley? Who's that? Jeffrey asks. My friend, we have been friends since high school back in B Cavern. Ever since the incident, I never saw her again. Never knew she worked for Horn Hornet Pharmaceutical. Evan says as he unpauses the tape, hearing her voice again. Entry log number 7. This is Carly Welburn, and I'm sorry, is this really necessary? Carly asked to another pharmacist. Yes, Mrs. Welburn. Continue on, said the pharmacist. That could be heard from the background as Carly sighs. Well, lately Dr. Mitchell, or who we have to call Doof, has been showing symptoms of mutation. He's gaining claws, for God's sake. Carly exclaims as the tape begins to glitch, cutting to the audio of Doof's now animalistic screams of pain as a picture of himself appears on screen, becoming more and more deformed. Ah! Jeffrey exclaimed as he covered his ears due to how damn loud the volume was, even if Evan never turned it up. So Evan removes the tape, causing the screaming and video to stop. There. Evan says as Jeffrey feels his ears. Are my ears bleeding? Jeffrey asks. What? Evan exclaims, before smirking. Nah, I can hear you perfectly. Evan says as the door swings open and Lucas comes in. The hell was all that screaming? 
Lucas explains. We'll explain to you all later when we write everything down and zeroize everything. Evan says as Lucas nods and leaves. After four or five minutes of writing things down and zeroizing, mostly zeroizing, Evan and Jeffrey come out and bring their findings to the others. Alright, so from what we were able to figure out and zeroize, their medicine seemed to have bugs as an in ingredient. One of these pharmacists, Mrs. Burnwell, is a supposed long lost friend of Evan, and that some of the side effects of the medicine caused the mutations. Jeffrey explains, these mutations could be oddly heard by the screaming that was coming out of the room we were in earlier. Evan explains, alright, but how about those series? Mike asks, well, it is our theory that some of the people who went missing in B Cavern were mutated by the medicine and are possibly under the control of the entity who killed Jack. Jeffrey Strolls falls up with, But why would it go after Jack? It's not like Jack worked at Hornet Pharmaceutical or something, right? Lucas asks as Mike clears his throat. Well, he did, Mike says as Lucas looks at him. How do you know? Lucas asks Mike. Well, Back then, he would tell me his stories of his time as a higher-up who looked over the production of the medicine made in Hornet Pharmaceutical. Mike said, So, does this mean that the entity is going after the survivors of the bee cavern disappearance? Lucas asks. Seems to be so, yeah, Evan replies. Well, maybe there is a way we can locate these survivors and bring them here to be safe, Mike suggests. Good idea. But how? Jeffrey asks as Lucas goes to a computer and starts asking for names, the others knowing what he is doing. In this house, Mike Sterlock was in his house, a large shed that he built in the middle of the woods next to a lake for his introvert self to feel comfortable. Then he hears a knock at the door. Fearing the worst, he arms himself and slowly approaches the door. Please don't be him. Please don't be him. Sterlock sinks as he takes a peek through the door's peephole to see Evan and Mike. Oh, people. At least it's not him, Sterlock shrugs as he puts his gun down on a nearby table and opens the door, still somewhat being behind it. Yes? Sterlock asks. Are you Mike Sterlock? Mike asks. Yes. Now what is it? Sterlock asks. Well, recently our police chief was murdered by an entity who was the corporate of the disappearance of B. Cavern, and we are looking for all survivors to be taken to a safer place, Evan says. No way, I'm not leaving my peaceful and quiet house to be around a group of people, Sterlock exclaims as Mike sighs. Well, how about we bring your house to a safe place, Evan says as Mike and Sterlock look at him. Lucas was waiting outside with a few other survivors, and he looks to his right, his eyes widening and his jaw dropping as he sees a large forklift transporting Sterlock in his house inside the saver place slash garage of the police station. He wouldn't come with us if we didn't bring his house, Mike tells Lucas, who was speechless. No, it's not that. I just didn't know Evan was forklift certified. Lucas comments. Later, Evan was asking the survivors questions about what happened, and Evan didn't get any answers because most of the survivors were just people who weren't people who worked at Hornet Farm Super. Then Strolock finally decides to speak up. I know, Strolock says as Evan looks over to him. Alright, go on. Evan replied that Strolock explains that before everything went wrong and B. Kevin disappeared, the entity that was known as the pharmacist, came out of his office, finally showing everyone what the founder slash owner of Hornet Pharmaceutical looked like, followed by him describing what the pharmaceutical looked like and how a part of his face melted and he began to devour everyone. Hornet Pharmaceutical, Chapter 4 Evan and Jeffrey get ready to watch Sir Tate. Do you have the remote on hand? Jeffrey asks Evan, Evan gripping the remote like his Evan Jr. Yes. Let's see what the third tape contains. Evan replies as he puts in the third VHS tape and the footage starts. The three logos as usual, followed by a new commercial. Ah, spring. Plants are blooming, the weather outside is nice, and most of us are attacked by the demon named Seasonal Allergies. The commercial says that Cesar appears on screen again. This time his eyes looked more realistic than before, almost like he had hyper-realistic eyes. Well, today I have just a thing for you. It's help me, help me, help me. The footage glitches, but then the footage cuts to an audio log of Cesar and what seems to be the pharmacist before he revealed his true appearance. 
So, Mr. Case, I I have read your resume, and you seem to be an inspiring actor. The pharmacist says. Yes, that is correct. I have only had a few roles in some medium productions, but I believe that I'll have I'll make it up in the world. Says your replies in what sound like a more happier tone. Wow, he sounds happier. Jeffrey comments as Evan makes notes. The audio log then cuts back to the commercial that then shows off another one of Hornet Pharmaceuticals products. These multicolored tablets that claimed they were for stopping both stomach pain and allergies for a total of 72 hours. Huh, that sounds handy. Jeffrey comments. True, but remember that the medicine from Hornet Pharmaceutical is Trojan medicine. Evan says as the footage starts to go static before quickly popping up an image. Wait, what's that? Jeffrey asks as Evan looked up to the footage to show to see the static. What was that? Or what was what? Evan asks. There was an image shown in the static for a bit. Jeffrey replies as Evan picks up the remote and rewinds, stopping as he sees an image. Looks like a medical report, Jeffrey says as Evan takes a look at it. Patients? Evan says to himself as he writes some more things down, Jeffrey unpausing the tape and the tape soon ending. Yeah, some of the disappearances are definitely because of these mutations, Evan says. But mutate into what exactly? Jeffrey asks. Well, from what I've gathered, something with big claws and animal and an animal-like body structure. Evan says as he and Jeffrey share their findings to the others. Lucas couldn't stop laughing about the fact that Hornet Pharmaceutical had a test subject named Doof. Well, what would we call these names anyways? Mike asks. Roxas. Dr. Sterlock says as he walks in. The others are surprised by his entrance. The pharmacist called these mutated people Proxes and would kidnap them after getting to the halfway mark in their mutation. Dr. Sterlock says, Well, what was he going to do with these proxies? Mike asks. Making an army. He planned on turning the world into a wasteland where the 99% were these proxies and the 1% would be himself and other pharmacists, Dr. Sterlock says. But how are you or any other possible pharmacist still alive? Wouldn't the pharmacist guy want all of you dead because of what you know? Lucas asks. Yes, he tried. He got most of us, but I and a few others were able to escape. Dr. Sherlock says as Evan looks up at him. Do you know who survived? Evan asks, hoping to know if his friend Carly was still out somewhere. Well, I saw Mrs. Welber jump out the window and go god knows where, and I saw Doof enter the vents. Still questioning if Doof is still alive, Dr. Sherlock says. <laughs> Doof. Lucas laughs. No, for an introvert, you sure are talkative, Toby replies. Well, I have to put aside my introvertism when offering information about Hornet Pharmaceutical, Dr. Sterlock says. Now, if you excuse me, I am overstaying my, my visit outside of my introvertism, and I must return to my house, Dr. Sterlock says as he leaves to his house that was moved into the garage of the police station. In an airport of Detroit, Michigan, Carly was waiting for her flight on a call with her mom. Please be careful, sweetie. You know how that place is, Carly's mom says. It's okay, mom. I know what I'm getting myself into, Carly says. Alright, just make sure to keep in touch, please, Carly's mom requests. Don't worry, I will, Carly replies. Alright. Thank you, sweetie. Carly's mom says as the call ends and Carly puts her flip phone away and she sighs. Alright. It's been a while since I've been back to Ted's country and it's... Carly thinks about Evan and how long it's been since she has seen him. I should have told him, told him where I escaped. Carly thinks as she gets up, leaving for her flight to Georgia. The next day, Evan got a package at his door and noticed that the package was covered in scratches. Huh? What's this? Evan asks himself as he picks up, picks it up and goes inside, setting the package on the counter and he opens it, finding a VHS that was dark red. Huh. I know colored VHS tapes are real, but I've never seen one like this before. Evan sinks as he takes it to the police station and watches it, only getting static with what seemed to be Morse code. Huh. Morse code. Maybe I can ask Lucas to translate this. Evan says as he takes out the tape and leaves the room. Evan walks out of the room and hands the tape to Evan. Where did you get this? Lucas asks. Well, it was in this package I received by someone anonymous. Evan replied. 
And are you sure there wasn't a bomb in this package? Lucas asks. Yes, I checked the whole scratch of box and everything. There was no bomb, thankfully. Evan replies as Lucas blows a sigh of relief, followed by asking what was on the tape. Static. Mostly static with some Morse code I need you to translate, Evan says. Alright, but I swear, if something spooky happens in this tape, I will personally come to your house and take a fat shit on your car. Lucas says as he leaves, Evan being a bit disgusted by the threat. But then, Evan hears a voice. A voice that he hasn't heard in so long. He looks over to see her. Carly. His friend he hasn't seen in so long. Carly. Evan asks. Yes, it's me, Evan. It's Carly. Carly says... Hornet Pharmaceutical, Chapter 5 Carly! You're still alive! Evan exclaims. Yes, I am. I'm sorry for not telling you where I was going, Carly says as Evan hugs her. What matters more is that you're still alive, Evan exclaims as Carly smiles a little. So, what brought you back here anyways, Lucas asks. Well, ever since I left after the cavern's disappearance, the case has just been eating away at me. So I have decided to come and help, Carly says. Great! Me and Jeffrey can get you caught up, Evan says. Jeffrey? Who's Jeffrey? Carly asks as Jeffrey comes in. Hi, I'm Jeffrey. It's nice to meet you. Before he could finish, something in Carly changed and she hugged him. You are my son now, Carly says as Jeffrey was taken back. Wait, what? Jeffrey says as Lucas laughs out in pure confusion. Evan and Jeffrey take Carly into the room the two were using to investigate the tapes. Evan and Jeffrey catch up Car Carly on the first three tapes in the mysterious maroon tape that Evan received. Huh, that's weird. But that Cesher guy didn't show up, Jeffrey comments. I remember seeing him around the pharmacy here and there, Carly comments. Really? What was he like? Evan asks. Well, he was flirty, truly a ladies' man. But also, he started to act more... How do I put this? Carly thinks. He was acting a bit more paranoid near the end of Hornet Pharmaceutical existing, Carly says. Well, this paranoia was definitely from what he seemed to know about that thing, Evan says, referring to the pharmacist. Alright, now that we got you all caught up, let's watch tape 4, Jeffrey replies as Evan puts the fourth tape in. The fourth tape starts off with the usual first three logos, then a message explaining that this tape consists of interviews that were done with police and some of the Hornet Pharmaceutical staff. Huh. This must have been before the whole disappearance event, Lucas says as the others look at him and Evan pauses the tape. Lucas, what are you doing here? Jeffrey asks. Yeah, I thought you hated these tapes, Evan asks. Yeah, I do, but I'm also a little interested in this one. It might convince me that I would have to try and be a little braver, which is what Jack would have wanted. Lucas replies as Evan shrugs and continues the tape. Three of the four interviews were all the same, but with slight differences to the end. The ending of each interview asks the question of, Now, does your employer have any information you'd like to share? Sanjur looked around and, com and commented, I would rather not... I would rather stay quiet. Dr. Sturlock was described as giving a simple shrug with his mouth being in the shape of a flat line, and Carly commented that she actually has never interacted with the boss, and that she guesses that the... Others probably have some information that are not willing to share. But then, there was the fourth interview, which was with Doof. Doof sounded like he was having a hard time talking, and the interviewer's first question was, What the hell happened to you? And then the tape cuts off. Huh. Evan mutters. So, what now? He says. Maybe we should try and find Doof? Jeffrey recommends. Good idea. I'll stay here and write to write everything down while you three go and find Doof, Evan says, as Lucas stares at him. You're joking, Lucas scoffs. Nope, now get going, Evan replies as Jeffrey and Carly leave, Lucas falling after. The three make their way into a forest that acts like a wall between Ted's country and Bee Cavern. Surprised this forest wasn't taken by Bee Cavern's disappearance. Like, at least a part of it was gone with Bee Cavern, his comments. Well, to be fair, the forest wasn't that close to Bee Cavern, or Ted's country, Carly replies as Jeffrey looks around. Man, this place is kind of creepy. Jeffrey comments, Yeah, which is why I don't, didn't want to come here, he replies. Oh, calm down, it's not like you were sent here by yourself, Carly comments. Okay, yeah, fair enough. Lucas shrugs as a loud screech is heard. What was that? Lucas screams as he holds up his shotgun that he brought with him. Must be them. Carly says as Jeffrey and Lucas look over to her. Who the fuck is them? Lucas asks as a deformed creature comes out of the bushes snarling. Holy shit! 
Lucas exclaims as he begins to shoot at the creature, and the creature dodges as more of these deformed creatures come out of the bushes and trees. What the hell are these things? Lucas screams as he shoots wildly, hitting a few of the creatures while the rest of the creatures dodge. Lucas, calm down! Jeffrey exclaims. Calm down? How the fuck am I supposed to calm down when Death is knocking at the door like a coked up P. Diddy trying to break into a kid's bedroom? Lucas exclaims as another creature arrives. Oh great, another before Lucas finishes sentence, the creature just the creature that just arrived kills one of the creatures. What the Jeffrey says as the creature begins killing and even ripping out chunks of the other creatures that eat. Wait, is that doof? Carly exclaims as the creature, revealed to be Doof, slides in front of the three as the pharmacist appears in front of the four as the remaining creatures begin to run off in fear. Doof snarls at the pharmacist, and the pharmacist just stares at them, and then vanishes. Doof then turns to the three. Oh my god, Doof! Carly exclaims. Carly. Doof says as he bends down and hugs her. Lucas was trying not to laugh due to him being scared that if he did laugh about Doof's name in front of Doof, Doof would kill him. I'm so glad you're still alive, buddy. Carly exclaims as she pets his head, causing him to let out some sort of happy noise. Something like a purr or something. Why are you out here? Doof asks. We came looking for you, Jeffrey says. Look. I know you aren't happy about how you look, but we will make sure others will understand and not be afraid of you, Carly says as Doof nods. Hornet Pharmaceutical, Chapter 6 Mike was at the reception desk drinking some coffee when he then looks up and spits out his coffee, seeing Jeffrey, Lucas, and Carly with Doof. Lucas walks over as Jeffrey and Carly take Doof to heaven. Look, just, just don't question it, Lucas said. Huh, so you're Doof, right? Heaven asks Doof. Yes. Pies. So, do you have an actual name or not? Evan asks. No, I, I was only a baby when my parents unwillingly donated me to the pharmacist. Oh, damn. I'm sorry to hear, Evan says, being taken aback by this information. Evan writes this down and he sticks the notes to a cork cord, realizing he would need another one. Hey, Jeffrey, Evan asks. Yeah? Jeffrey turns to Evan. Hey, could you ask Mike for an extra pork cord? Evan asks. Oh, sure. Jeffrey replies as he and Carly take Doof to the garage. A little later, Jeffrey and Carly come back with a few extra pork cords and some things to put all the pork cords up. Hey, thank you, Evan says as... Evan says as Jeffrey and Carly were taken back by everything that Evan has written down. Wow. You sure, you sure have been getting a lot of information for this, Carly says. Correct. Evan says as the three put... The spare cork cords up. Alright, y'all ready to watch the fifth tape? Evan asks. No, me and Jeffrey are going to go out somewhere. Carly says as Jeffrey looks at her. We are? Jeffrey asks as Carly leaves, taking Jeff along with her. Huh. Oh well. Evan shrugs as he inserts the fifth tape into the TV. Carly and Jeffrey went to a little plaza. So, what are we doing here? Jeffrey asks Carly. Well, I want to get to know you, Carly says as the two go to a little burger shop. After getting your food, Jeffrey decides to open up the Carly. So, we promise you won't freak out, Jeffrey asks. Yes, I'm positive. You can tell me anything, Carly says as Jeffrey breathes in, then out. Ready, Jeffrey says. Jeffrey talks about how four years ago, he murdered his parents and eight other people before being arrested. This surprised Carly, but she stayed calm and continued to listen. Don't know why I did it. It just felt like something in me broke and I just snapped. Jeffrey says as he continues on how he was in jail for four years until his bail was posted by family member slash therapist, Toby. Jeffrey continues on how his therapist has been trying to find out why Jeffrey just snapped that day. Oh dear. I see. Carly says as Jeffrey slowly tears up and he covers his face with his hands. Sometimes I can't even look at myself. What I did to my face, my parents, those, old, those eight people. Jeffrey whimpers and shivers. Carly sighs and sits next to him and hugs him. Jeffrey was quiet as he hugs back, sniffling. It's okay, sweetheart. I'm here. Carly says as she caresses Jeffrey's head in a kind and caring way. Meanwhile, Evan just finished watching the tape and he was writing everything down. Damn, Evan. So that's why you needed all these cork cords. Mike asks as Evan looks over to him. Yeah, there's a lot to look over, Evan says as Mike looks at the board. Hey, you do realize you wrote down things twice, right? Mike asks. Yes, I do know. And I did that on purpose, so no information gathered is forgotten, Evan replies. Huh. 
I don't get why we never had you on the police force, Mike comments. Well, Jack didn't like him, Lucas says as Mike and Evan look over him. You know how he was with detectives, he didn't like them one bit, Lucas replies. Yeah, he does have a point. I remember two years ago trying to bring up this case with him the last time I visited, and he just said that he didn't trust me, and he told me to scram, Evan says as Mike remembers those events. Yeah, fair point. Although I really wish I got to ask him why he didn't trust detectives, Mike says. Well, anyways, I'm going now on my break. Why I came from McDonald's? Possess. I'll just have some chicken nuggets and fries with a side of Coke, Evan replies. Give me six Big Macs, Mike says as Lucas and Evan stare at Mike. They're serious. Mike grabs Lucas and looks at him in the face. Six sexy Big Macs. Mike says as Lucas felt threatened. Uh, on it, Lucas says as he quickly leaves. Jeffrey and Carly coming back and Evan gets up and stretches. Hey Evan, we're back, Jeffrey says as he looked over to them. Oh, hey, how was your little day out? Evan asks. Good. I'm happy Carly took me out, Jeffrey replies. So, what did the fifth tape contain? Carly asks. Evan explains that the tape contained audio of an interview between the police officer of B Cavern and the pharmacist, followed by explaining that the pharmacist was very vague in his answer. All I could really get out of it that the police officer who did the interview was reported missing a week after the interview. Then Lucas rushes in, catching his breath. Oh, hey, Lucas, what's up? Carly asks. Hey, where are my Big Macs? Mike asks. I couldn't get any of the orders. The McDonald's I was at got shot up. Lucas explains that everyone looks at him. McDonald's was shut up? Mike asks. He was surprised because Ted's country hasn't had a shooting since the week after the city was made. Police, Lucas, and Mike arrive at the McDonald's to take down the active shooter. The man, 35 and a bit on the chubby side, looked like he was crazy and had a twitch in his eye. Sir, put down the gun! One of the police officers shouts as the man, man smile and begins firing off randomly, causing the police to shoot at the man. Before the man goes down, he fires one more shot that bounces around and then splat. The bullet went through Lucas's head, obliterating, obliterating his face and knocking him down. Lucas! No! Mike yells in agony. Hornet Pharmaceutical, Chapter 7. News of the McDonald's shooting was everywhere in Ted's country, along with the death of Lucas Jones. Oh my god. Harley says as Jeffrey and Evan were taken back. God damn it, god damn it, god damn it! Mike yells as he slams his fist on the desk, followed by holding his head and covering his face as he sobs relentlessly. Excuse me, but do you know anything about the shooter in question? Evan asked one of the officers. Well, he seemed to have some sort of crazed look in his eye, and. Actually, speaking of his eyes, his eyes seem to be glowing, the officer answers. Glowing? Evan asks as he writes this down. Yes, glowing. It was really weird, and, he, and they only stopped glowing when he died, the officer replies, as Evan thinks that this is definitely related to the pharmacist. Alrighty, thank you for letting me know. Evan says as the officer nods, and Evan goes to watch and analyze the sixth tape. But then he stops at Mike's desk, seeing Mike laying his head on his desk, quietly crying. Hey Mike? Evan asks as Mike looks over to Evan. Yeah. Mike replies, looking very depressed. Sorry about Lucas. He was a good man and he didn't deserve to die. Evan replies as he comes next to Mike as Mike reaches under his desk for something. He pulls out a full book and opens it. We have been friends since we were babies, Mike says, looking at the first picture in the book, which was of Mike and Lucas as babies. Mike looks through the book, showing pictures of the two at school, the playground, on holidays, and more. Our parents were family friends. We would always do everything together, Mike says as he reaches a blank page that was followed with 12 more blank pages. We were supposed to grow old together. We were supposed to share many more happy memories after we retired. Now we can't. He's gone. Mike says as he quietly cries. Evan puts his hand on his shoulder and Mike looks up at him. Hey, I and the others will be here for you. Evan says as Mike wipes his tears. Together, we will make sure Lucas gets justice and we will make sure that whatever is going on stops. Evan says as Mike gets up and hugs him. Thank you, Evan. Mike says as he calms down. After the hug, Evan turns around to go and watch the sixth tape when Mike taps him on the shoulder. Yes? Evan asks as he turns to Mike. Hey, if I don't make it to the end of this, 
Could y'all look over my phone book and make sure it goes to my and Lucas's families? My guess as Evan was taken back a bit. Uh, oh, yeah. Well, Evan says as he was hoping that Mike would make it to the end of what is going on. Evan goes in the room and sits down, entering the inserting the six tape into the TV and the tape play, playing. Showing the user's three logos and dead footage of what seemed to be the pharmacist himself, but he was shrouded in darkness, and the only thing Evan could make out was his hands. We are getting close to the day. The day. A day where I can finally come out of the office and give the world a nice hello. The pharmacist says, The day will be filled with so much joy and hellos from so many new people. The pharmacist says as suddenly a bunch of glowing eyes appear in the background of footage. What the fuck? Evan mutters, I have so many helpers who will help with spreading the joy around me, Cavern. They just can't wait to spread so much joy. The pharmacist says as the glowing eyes begin to show their faces, causing a realization to form in Evan's head. Wait. Her eyes. Evan says as he starts to put two and two together as the tape ends. Oh god. Evan says as Jeffrey walks in. Oh, am I late? Jeffrey asks as Evan looks over to him. Get Carly and Mike. Y'all might want to see this. Evan replies. Evan shows them the tape and after the tape ends, they were all taken back. You mean to tell us that this pharmacist can control people? Jeffrey asks Evan. Yes, he seems to have the ability of mind control. Mean that whatever happened with the shooter of that McDonald's was under the control of the pharmacist, Evan says. Evan, Jeffrey, and Carly talk about his new discovery as Mike was in the background, slowly closing his fists. Mike leaves the room and he grabs his backpack and begins to fill with some guns and ammunition. Mike was going to make sure the pharmacist was going to pay for what he did to his friend. Evan writes down everything as Jeffrey excuses himself and leaves to the bathroom. Borrowing a notepad and pen from the re receptionist's desk. There he goes into a stall and begins to write down a plan on the notepad. Hopefully my service doesn't find this. Every says to himself as he finishes his plan, then leaves the bathroom. He comes back and sees Evan destroy the seventh tape. Whoa, why are you destroying the seventh tape? Jeffrey asks in confusion as Evan looks over to him. The tape. The pharmacist almost came out of the screen of the TV. Carly exclaims as Jeffrey was taken aback. Wait, Wait, really? Jeffrey asks as Evan holds up the pharmacist's sliced off arm. See? Evan replies as Jeffrey was quiet. Ah, I see. Jeffrey comments. So, what now? Jeffrey asks as Evan and Carly look at each other and nod, then look back at Jeffrey. Well, now we go to the place where B Cavern was at, Evan says. Evan, Carly, Jeffrey, and Mike get ready. Hey, Doof. Carly asks Doof as. He looks at her. We're going back to B Cavern to take down the pharmacist. We will need your help. Carly says as Doof nods and joins them. Dr. Sterlock reluctantly joins and Jeffrey's therapist was reluctant to let Jeffrey go with the others. Toby, please, let me help them. I want to help take down this pharmacist freak. Jeffrey says as Toby sighs and finally agrees to let Jeffrey help the others. Mike leads them to a squad car and they drive off to where B Cavern once was. Ordinate Pharmaceutical, Chapter 8. They arrived. Mike parks the squad car and they all get out. Alright, we're here. Mike says as Dr. Sherlock gulps and Carly stays close to both Evan and Jeffrey. The group walk to a large, shallow crater that had some dings of rubble around. Any plants around were dead, and any small crater seen approaching the area would turn back immediately. Jeffrey even noticed a black bear approach the crater, only to turn around and leave immediately. Enough, star enough stalling. Let's go. Evan says as the group walks into the crater. The crater contained more and more rubble with a few half-destroyed houses, with the Hornet Pharmaceutical being in the center of the crater of some sort of hill. That's weird. Hornet Pharmaceutical wasn't in the middle of the cavern, Harley says. Yeah, there's some sort of fountain and some flower gardens in the middle. Dr. Sirlock comments as they begin to approach the hill. Then the screech was heard. Oh no. Mike says as the pharmacist experiments begin to arrive. Run! Mike yells as the group begins to run towards Hornet Pharmaceutical, only for more creatures to burst out of the place. What the hell? Jeffrey yells as they stop, being surrounded by the creatures. Guess this is in for us? Dr. Sherlock asks. No, not yet, Mike says as he loads his guns. Mike starts firing as Doof lunges out to attack, followed with Dr. Sherlock pulling out a paddleboard and Evan pulling out a hand cannon. 
Hey, where do you get that? Mike asks Evan. Oh, you know, I found it in the back of Jack's office. Evan says as he takes a shot at one of the creatures. Jerry stood by Carly, waiting for the pharmacist to arrive so he could enact his plan. Then, the creatures begin to back away as the pharmacist himself arrives. You. Mike exclaims as the pharmacist looks at the group and tilts his head a bit. Huh. Was not expecting survivors. The pharmacist says as Doof lunges at the pharmacist, only for the pharmacist's tentacles to grab Doof and rip him in half. Doof! No! Carly yells as the pharmacist throws Doof's rip in half corpse to the ground for his creature to feast on. Doof's dying scream is being heard by the others. Mike starts shooting at the pharmacist, causing the pharmacist to twitch and his tingles flailing around a bit as he turns to Mike. Oh, I remember. The pharmacist says as Mike reloads his gun. Of course you do! You're the bastard who made some random guy kill my friend! Mike exclaims as he starts to shoot at the pharmacist again, causing the pharmacist to start chuckling. The pharmacist sends his tentacles after Mike, but thankfully Dr. Sterlock rushes over to slap them away. This annoys the pharmacist and he ends up grabbing the power board from Dr. Sterlock and hits him in the head and throws him to the side, crashing into Evan. Mike goes to reload again, only to get impaled in the gut and pulled over to the pharmacist. Mike coughs up blood and the pharmacist looks at Mike in the face, his head tilting a bit. Strange. I've never seen a human try to put up a fight against me. The pharmacist says, Fuck. You. Mike says as the tentacle wraps around Mike's neck, squeezes, then pop. Mike's head bursted like a heavily diseased ball sack. Mike! Evan yells. Yes? Dr. Sorlega asks as he ropes his head. No, not you. The other Mike. Evan exclaims as he gets up as the pharmacist throws Mike's body aside and looks at Carly. Oh no, you don't! Evan yells as he runs to Carly, only for the pharmacist to knock him away with one of his tentacles. Jerry jumps up in front of Carly and as he is grabbed by the pharmacist's tentacles and is pulled to him. What an odd little boy, trying to protect your mother. Pathetic. The pharmacist says as Jeffrey squirms and he sees the flesh in his face crater of the pharmacist getting him out of the way, revealing the multiple twitching and changing faces of his victims. Jeffrey smirks and is able to reach into his bag for something, pull out, pulling out the ding of grenades and pulling one of the grenade pins and shoving it into the crater of the pharmacist's face. Jeffrey pulls out some duct tape that he took from the storage and uses it to make sure the bag is stuck to the pharmacist's face crater. Oh, bum, motherfucker! Jeffrey exclaims as the grenades go off and explode, the blast sending Jeffrey flying into the ground. Oh my god, Jeffrey, are you okay? That was so dangerous! You could've gotten killed or died! Oh my lord, you're okay! Carly panics as she helps him up. I, I'm fine. It just might be my left leg that is a bit fractured. Jeffrey replies as he, Evan, Carly, and Dr. Sterlock look over to the pharmacist. His head and shoulders area was completely annihilated and his body collapses to the ground. Turning into dust as the creature screeched and ran back into a horned pharmaceutical. January 6, 2010. Evan and Carly were now detectives of Ted Country Police Department along with Jeffrey and Dr. Sterlock who recently started to open up more. So, what's going on today? Evan asked an officer. Nothing much. Today really is a slow work day. The officer replies as a newly hired officer walks in. Oh, hello there, new recruit. What's your name? Carly asks the man. Oh, I'm Jake Azazel, Mike's nephew. Jake replies as everyone looks at him. Azazel? I haven't heard that name in a while. Evan replies as he holds out his hand for Jake to shake. Jake happily shakes Evan's hand, and before going to his desk, Evan gives him something. He wanted y'all to have this. Evan says as Jake holds it, holds the book and tears up a bit. Thank you, Evan. This means so much to us. Jake says as he hugs Evan. Evan hugging back. And that was another audiobook of my original story, Hornet Pharmaceutical. Uh, so yeah, you can actually go read this uh, story on Wattpad at Fun Fox Productions, and and you also have the option to buy this book digitally on my merch store. Uh, more stories will be coming soon. I actually do like doing these audiobooks, even if obviously uh, my writing still needs some work and a bunch of other things. But yeah, um, yeah, I had fun making this. Uh, definitely do plan on doing more audiobooks soon. So uh, yeah. Uh, so, anyways, that was it for this video. Make sure you all subscribe and like for more, and I'll see you all later. Peace out, home guards, and goodbye!